Let's go to win. Come on, lighting. I knew this was going to be a problem. <laughs> The ancient Greeks were able to infer the size of the Earth simply by paying attention to shadows in wells and knowing the distances between some cities. These cities were necessarily very far apart, and you would have had a lot of difficulty traveling between them. Certainly it wouldn't have happened in just a couple of days. But today, many of us live where the roads are good and traveling hundreds of miles isn't difficult to imagine at all, and you don't actually need to have a well just a stick will do. Because of this, I set out to measure the size of the Earth for myself. First, I need to find a way to measure the distance between two cities. So we are on the highway now, uh, heading south, but I'm gonna go ahead and reset my trip monitor um, on the odometer here so I can have a good zero point for how far we're going, um, and that will give me how far I've traveled south when I do finally measure the shadow. Sure, I could have just used Google Maps, but that's hardly making the measurement myself. The destination here is Pueblo, Colorado, which is about 100 miles or 161 kilometers due south of my home in Denver. I also need to have something to cast a shadow with. In this instance, I just got a couple of stakes from the hardware store and stuck them together with a little hinge there. So the idea is that as the sun shines down, I can line this up with the shadow that it's making, and I need a protractor and a piece of string, then all I would do is measure the angle from the top of the stick to the tip of the shadow. It's also important I made this measurement near solar noon. In my case, that meant 11 o'clock, because in Colorado, we're on daylight savings time. Then I aligned the bottom stake with the shadow cast by the vertical stake and confirmed with a compass that it was pointing north. If it wasn't, it would mean that I had missed solar noon. Then I simply stretched a string from the tip of the upright stake to the end of the cast shadow and measured the angle with a protractor. 58 and a half. And then you have to remember to record your odometer that you set to measure your distance. So we went a little bit over before we remembered to uh, record the distance. It's uh, 111. It turned out that it was actually about 108 miles, but my friend and I had been driving for a couple minutes before we remembered to record the odometer. Now, I wasn't able to measure the shadow again at my house the same day, because obviously I was in Pueblo, but I didn't get to do it the next day either because there was a blizzard and the sun wasn't out. On the day after, I did manage to make it. Now, this might have been a problem if it wasn't already close to the solstice. As you know, the angle that the Earth makes with the sun changes throughout the year. The angle of the Earth's axis is fixed, of course, but as the Earth progresses around the sun in its orbit, the angle toward the sun changes. And this change is also what makes the changes in the length of the day. This pattern can be represented by a simple sine wave. As you approach the winter solstice, the days become shorter and shorter until they stop. And the tilt stops. That's the solstice. Ooh. Means standing still. Ooh. Rocket solstice. Ooh. And then they start to become longer. But take a look at the graph down here near the winter solstice. If I move a little bit one way or a little bit the other way, the total change in the length of the day is very small. Whereas up here toward the equinox, if I move just a little bit along the time axis, the change in the length of the day is huge and the corresponding angle changes as well. This affects the angle of the shadow that I would be measuring. But down here, near the solstice, it stays relatively the same from day to day. And when we get to the summer solstice, the small change in a couple of days doesn't make a great change in the length of the day. So all you southern hemispheres, near December 21st is still a great time for this project. So after two days, the sun did come out and I was able to make my final measurement. Excellent. 60. So now I take the distance traveled and divide it by the difference in the degrees. So that's 60 minus 58 and a half, which condenses to 1.5 degrees. This is the rate of change for how far I go. So for every 108 miles I go, I got 1.5 degrees angle change. Since I know that the Earth is round, all I have to do is multiply this rate times 360 degrees to get the total distance 
all the way around the Earth. So for this full circumference, I got 25,920 miles, or about 41,700 kilometers, which is about 1,000 miles, or 1,700 kilometers too big. But still, that's within 4% of the accepted size of the Earth. And that's not even attempting to count for the slight back and forth and extra side streets that I drove on. In a previous video, I used the size of the Earth to help determine the distance to the moon, and I just said that the size of the Earth was a, a known quantity, something that you could figure out. Well, now you know how it can be figured out. Since it's a holiday season, I expect a lot of you are going to be traveling. So on your travels, I'm hoping that some of you will go ahead and try it out. And since it's near the solstice, a day, give or take, isn't going to make a big difference when you're making this sort of a measurement. Just make sure that when you take the difference between your two locations, you're just talking about the north-south difference and not any east-west variation. You can find more details and experiments on my blog, or you can click the subscribe button for more DIY science experiments. If you do try this one out, I'd love to see your results in the comments because you can science it. Well, no, I just don't know where I'm going. Being lost is a combination of not knowing where you are and not knowing where you're going.